Thanks, fellow Who Gazers, and welcome back to Doctor Who Literature, the podcast taking you through the world of the target novelizations in publication order. My name is Jason, and I'm your host on this journey, this very long journey. This week, the Doctor Who world, well, all of British pop culture, lost actor Bernard Cribbins, whose association with Doctor Who stretched from the second theatrical Dalek movie all the way up through, well, the still-in-progress RTD special with David Tennant and Catherine Tate that's probably not coming out until next year, 2023. I am not as familiar with Mr. Cribbins' body of work as I did not grow up in the UK and I have not seen the vast majority of his output, but I do know him as the narrator to Simon in the Land of Chalk Drawings, which, via its inclusion on the very long-running syndicated American program Romper Room, was as much a staple of my childhood viewing as any American series. He will be missed, and how fortunate that he has one last story still yet to air. We have a new email address, Doctor Who Literature, that's Dr. Who Literature at Gmail. My one listener letter this week comes from Texas. This is Toby in Houston. Dear Doctor Who Literature, Toby writes, really enjoying your show but you've gotten a little negative the last few weeks. You're becoming a crank. You've got some really good books coming up, hoping for some less contrary takes out of you. Don't get me wrong, I still catch every episode as it drops. What are your Doctor Who podcasting influences? Warmest regards, Toby in Houston. Thanks, Toby. I wouldn't say I'm a crank, I just have opinions. Well, I have a ton of Doctor Who podcasting influences, and of course many non-Who influences as well, like the History of Literature podcast and Karina Longworth's You Must Remember This. Just to give three quick Who podcast shout-outs, and there are many others, including several upcoming guests, so this list is not to sell anyone short. It's just this is a long episode, and I want to get to it. I'll give you the three shows that have most directly influenced this one. Trap 1, obviously. That's the show that got me into podcasting regularly. The Nyman Be Praised with Jack and Joe, which is just two old friends and Who fans celebrating what they love about the show, which is most of it, and they spare no opinion in harshing on the stuff they don't love, which is a small fraction of it, and I'd like to think that I keep a similar ratio. And then third is Gallifrey's Most Wanted, and it's spin off the Runcible Report. I recorded an episode with Ross recently, but I really love listening to those two shows. Ross and Vic, and then Ross and Jeff, are super respectful of all of Doctor Who. Then they criticize when they need to, but they're mostly positive about everything, especially the old stuff. I aspire to their ideal, but of course, I often fall short. This week, a few programming notes. We're up to the Talons of Wang Chiang. This is a controversial TV story and book. You don't need me to tell you. It is still rated super high on fan surveys, but the story's critics, and the critics are many and increasing in number over the years, often state that the story's flaws might erase any merit the story has. There's a broad range of opinions out there. I first saw the story in 1985, and from the get-go I loved it. My guests this week, of whom more in a moment, I think you're going to do an excellent job of praising the bits of the story that deserve praise, while otherwise giving an unstinting look at what doesn't work and why. It was a hard-hitting and delightful conversation. The laughter and the clapping will sometimes drown out the audio, but I regret none of it, and I can't wait for you to hear it. Now, we had some audio problems recording, and the first three minutes were unfortunately not salvageable. So my introduction of the two guests... And the first few minutes of witty banter after that are sadly lost to history and cannot be recovered. I'll just tell you that we have two longtime Doctor Who fans and prolific writers, The New Adventures, The Eighth Doctor Adventures, Big Finish, you name it. And for 30 years now, friends of mine in real life as well as online, and I was at their stateside wedding, though they now live in Australia, John Blum, who you heard here back on episode 10, and making her Doctor Who literature debut, Kate Orman. In the material that's lost, I mentioned that this story slash book is so big and so problematic that I needed not one guest but two to help me break it down, 
And then I dropped in an unscripted joke about how those two guests were supposed to be Sid and Marty Croft, but they weren't available, so I brought in John and Kate instead. I then thanked Kate for her generosity in 1993, for answering every single one of my many fan emails. I was going almost chapter by chapter, if not page by page, when her debut new adventure, The Left-Handed Hummingbird, came out. That was the first new adventure that lived in my world, with references to the Eagles and Star Trek TNG, where most of the previous books were steeped in a British pop culture, for which I did not have a lot of common ground. Kate told me, in the material that got lost, that she actually printed and saved a lot of her fan emails at the time. I then made some reference to the epic knockdown drag-out fights, sometimes approaching flame wars, that John and I had on Records Doctor Who around the same time, and we both joked about how far we've come since then, and of course how John's emails to Kate ended up leading to their eventual marriage. And that's where we will join my interview with John Blum and Kate Orman, already in progress. Let's get to it. Right, so um, both of you, and here we are 30 years on from the Rec Arts Doctor here, both of you guys have new uh, books coming out. John last time was on to discuss the novelization of The Abominable Snowmen, which is a story with problematic uh, portrayed Asian characters, which has nothing at all to do with the subject of today's conversation, The Talons of Wang Chiang. <laughs> to that awkward topic, Kate, I am very, very excited that you have a new book out that was recently announced. Could you tell the audience? I have uh, written an audio novel for Big Finish, uh, which is called Doctor Who and the Dead Star, or probably just the Dead Star. And uh, it won't actually be released until January next year. So I have to have a long and impatient wait for it. Um but uh, it's a Patrick Troughton doctor with uh, Ben and Polly. And uh, when they, uh, they said to me, I, I got this email saying, would you like to write a big Finnish Doctor Who audio novel? You know, it, it won't be like an audio where they, they have a script and, and actors come in and, and all of that, but it will be read by one person. Uh, but we will add sound effects and so forth. Um, so I thought, and they said, but do you want to do a Patrick Troughton one? And I thought for about, a minute. I thought I don't really want to do a Patrick Trout. I don't really, I don't really know Patrick Trout's Doctor that well. I really want to do a different Doctor. And and then I thought, what am I saying? <laughs> um, and I shot. I can't remember if they said do you want to do Ben and Polly, and that was what actually sealed the deal. Because I thought, God, that would be so much fun. Um, or if I thought of that and said, can I do Ben and Polly? Uh, I'd have to go back through my files or my emails to to figure that out. But it really, I just clicked into my head, no, this is going to be so much fun. Um, and you can do all of that uh, that wonderful 60s stuff. A lot of the book is set in the late 60s, sort of around that Troughton era time. Oh, wow. And I thought, John and I spend an awful lot of time over dinner watching, um, you know, The Avengers and um, all these other shows that, are, that were made in the late 60s. Uh, and we're kind of really familiar by now with that whole television land. Uh, and, you know, why not do a whole lot of that in the book and then also go off and do a whole lot of outer space? And um, when I was a little girl, I was completely obsessed with the solar system, um, which was uh, like reading books for kids that would tell you the names of each planet and something about each planet. And you would pick it up like nerd knowledge where you, you, you had this whole uh, thing where you knew everything about it you had all the details and um so I loved all of that and then I I had been reading actually listening to a lot of stuff on YouTube or watching stuff on YouTube about the solar system about outer space and black holes which are my babies I love them um and you know so okay well make that the other half of the book is all of that that fabulous exciting stuff and um and what's lurking in the outer darkness at the edge of the solar system? No, That's so right. <laughs> Just we, 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 the more we find out, the more we realize we haven't got a clue. We don't know what's going on. 
uh, a, we don't know what's out there. And so, you know, things that were actually quite, you know, fun and exciting for me, I just thought, okay, right, they're just going to go straight in. Um, so I had an absolute ball writing it. And uh, I had an absolute ball reading it. Yeah. Oh, well, yes. Thank you for your feedback, which was invaluable. And um, one of the things I, I thought was that she managed to get both sides of the 60s experience. She's got the um, stuff that's actually set in the sort of avengers countryside and um, half of it in Avengers land and the other half in a multinational space station. So we've got the entire oh. 60s experience. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, well, I mean, I love in Doctor Who. And, and it's not the only culprit. Um, the multinational space station means there is a French person. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was. Um, yeah, in, in, in the novelization of the Moon Base, which we covered on this program several months ago, we discussed it was uh, an English, uh, a French, a Danish, an American, <laughs> all the white Anglo Saxons. Very, very diverse. And the one black dude who literally dies first, as I recall. <laughs> dies within three seconds of appearing, yes. Maybe two lines of dialogue in the entire uh, four-part yeah. serial. Kate, who is the narrator going to be for this? Do you know yet? It's Michael Troughton. Oh, oh that is phenomenal. Wow. I know. I'm so excited. So uh, I, uh, I haven't actually heard it yet. I suppose they're still putting in all of the special effects and black hole noises and things. Um, but, uh, yeah, I'm really looking forward to hearing it. I had just watched as part of my Twitter pilgrimage last Christmas a few days ago, and he, of course, has a co-starring role in that. And his, his resemblance to Patrick Troughton is kind of uncanny at times. Yeah, it's, uh, it's going to be a little bit strange. I mean, he's going to be doing his dad's voice. I, if he's done another one of these, I haven't actually got around to listening to it, so I don't know what he's going to sound like, but it'll be a bit eerie, I suspect. Um, but uh, but how, how wonderful. I'm, I'm absolutely dying to do another one of these audio novels now. The only problem is I've burned up all of my really good material in this book, so I'll have to go out and get some more obsessions so I can put them into the... I, I always write based on whatever I'm ridiculously interested in uh, at the time, but I'm sure I'll build something else you know, in time for another script. So it'll be good. Well, we've been talking for um, for ages about how we should just sit down and just brainstorm a whole bunch of possible plots just so we can throw them six proposals and just keep burying them in uh, documents uh, with the out outlines and so forth until they finally have to, until they finally have to buy one of ours just to shut us up. <laughs> yeah, yes. I'd love oh. to write one with John. I think that would be a blast. But, yeah. you know, but I'll also write one without him. I just want to write one. So... <laughs> So, Kate, you uh, grew up, obviously, I know you were in the States for a portion of your childhood and you were otherwise in Australia. How did you become a Doctor Who fan in the first place? What was your experience with the show on television and, of course, with the novelizations as well? Well, they were a natural part of the landscape in the 70s in Australia. Uh, Doctor Who was very popular. Um People watched it with their kids before the news. And it, it was shown all the time. The ABC repeated it or, or screened new episodes, usually for four days a week. So um, it was ubiquitous. Your teachers knew about it. Um, you know, um, so there was that sort of taking it in with the mother's milk aspect. But then there's becoming a fan, which is where... Um, uh, it's funny, actually. I thought that what happened was that I got a big crush on Peter Davison. And yet I look back and I realise I've never had a big crush on Peter Davison. I mean, it's not that he isn't extremely handsome, but I've never fancied him. So what was going on? And I realise now that I, I have bipolar disorder type 2. And what was really happening was that I was having my first hypermanic episodes as a teenager, and they were associated with Doctor Who. So... And this is hilarious now um, when the doctor gets shot at the end of episode one of um, Arc of Infinity. I spent an entire weekend worrying about that, you know, like, was he okay? And then um, <laughs> I now look back and I realise it's because you were off your trolley, dear. You, you, you had fallen off the rocking horse and you were wildly excited about something that only required a small amount of excitement. And so, so there was that phase of me being a fan. And then I finally found fandom 
per se in, in about uh, 1987 when I discovered there were um, meetings and uh, so forth going on in Sydney. And, um, you know, I could share this crazy excitement with other people and uh, how splendid was that and probably very good for my mental health as well, I suspect. And it was only it was only six years from that until your first book sale to Virgin Publishing. So what got you into writing fan fiction? What got you into pitching what became Left Handed Hummingbird to uh, Virgin Books? Well, there were two things there, I think. I started writing the fanfic probably because I was terribly, terribly excited. And, um, you know, I don't know whether that was I was nuts, but uh, more importantly, suddenly there are other people to share this stuff with. So if I wrote a little story, other people would put it in their fanzine. And, I mean, that was great. That was sort of this incredible validation, even if probably only three people read the damn thing. <laughs> Um, but, you know, it didn't matter. It didn't matter. And I had this ambition that I was going to have a story published in every fanzine in Australia, which was probably about eight fanzines or something. Because uh, this was this was before the internet as we know it. This was all paper. Um, yes. th- those were amazing days. Um, so there was that going on. And that was good for me uh, because it meant that I was writing all the time. So I was getting a lot of practice in. Um, and um, it was interesting too you mentioned the target novelizations which I didn't speak to of course every school library was full of target novelizations and we had a couple in the house when I was a kid uh, and one of which I'm pretty sure was the talent novelization um, you jammy bastard novelizations in your school library oh, I envy yeah. that so oh. much I would never have left I know <laughs> not the American experience no I know <laughs> I, we're very very lucky in, in certain ways um, in many ways but um, so I think the, tar- the target novelizations kind of taught me how you could write in a kind of not really understanding what I was doing way, but in a rough, I kind of understand what this should look like way. So I was running all the fan fiction, um, but I was also interested in becoming a writer as a professional. And so for me, the fanfic was like good practice for that goal. And um, uh, I understood, th- I'd read a bit about how to become a writer from those, you know, those sorts of um, how to become a writer books. And they would explain things like um, uh, writing as much as you could, sending off as many proposals as you could. When the proposal gets rejected and it comes back to you, then simply turn it around and send it to a different market. You can't do that with a Doctor Who novel. <laughs> oh, but, right. you know, getting straight back up on the horse and, and sending your next one in and all those sorts of things. So I had a little bit of... Um, knowledge about what, how to do it, how to approach it. Uh, it was a problem, though, for, uh, for a long time because I didn't understand that this, this wasn't the only way to write fan fiction. And so, the, you know, for most fans, it's fun. It's relaxing. It's a way to communicate with other fans and have a fun time. But I was very professional. You had to do it like this. You had to do it like that because I'd read my How to Write books. Um, and so once I chilled out a bit, I think I stopped worrying about that so much and kind of harassing people. Oh, no, you have to do this. You, have, you, you, must, um, you must be aiming for professional publication because, you know, that, that's what happened to me. That's, that's how I cracked it. Um, I still remember you tr- sort of trying to badger me into act- doing a new adventures proposal. I mean... Did God, you, did I? Yeah, you made. I I probably, was, I'm sure I did. I'm yeah, glad I did. You were saying that I should um, uh, be writing for the things. I eventually reached the point where you were so determined to get me published that you were willing to write with me. I guess. So. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's that's probably the case. No, I mean yeah. I, I've always been a little bit of a bossy boots, and I think that's one one um, one way in which that manifested. But I'm too old and tired these days to tell people what they should be doing. So. <laughs> Well, John certainly got mentioned in enough new adventures before he finally uh, wrote one himself. I think there's probably about 15 books that have some variation of John or Blum. There was the one book that had that has Blumons as a uh, subatomic particle. Oh, really? I remember the Blumonator being somewhere in there. <laughs> <laughs> your your fame your fame uh, will be will ring out forever, John. <laughs> oh dear. How funny. Well, it's like a, it's my, one of my tiny claims to fame is being a, a walk-on in human nature. So I'm one step away from actually being canonical Doctor Who in that respect. There you go. <laughs> wow. Yes. And then there is the uh, law student vampire character who shares my middle name in vampire science, which I suppose is my enduring claim to fame in this world. Ah, uh, yes. We gave you a good death scene. I recall that. <laughs> 
I got to make the doctor laugh first before I got staked to death for shooting my mouth off, which kind of is a metaphor for my Rec Arts Doctor Who experience vis-a-vis John over there. <laughs> well, believe me, nothing against you in terms of killing you off. We basically wanted to give you a... a, a, a I recall writing a good exit line for you. You're in the middle of te- basically telling the villain, villain off for being what, for being such an idiot. And I'm, and this, I believe, yeah, it was this mon- monomaniacal vampire just going on. It's all blood, 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 war, war, war. You'd think after 400 years you have another topic of a conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that bit. <laughs> That was fun. I mean, Vampire Science, which was our first co-written book, was just possibly one of the best writing experiences I've ever had. In that, Kate and I were absolutely in sync. We were at that point uh, in, engaged and new, and generally and generally walking around a little cloud of endorphins the whole time there, with little little hearts hanging over our heads. And we, it was the easiest collaboration I've, I've ever had, and I was it, was it was a delight. Well, it was an honor to be killed by you in print. Thank you very much. <laughs> Splendid. So, speaking of killing things, let's uh, rake towns of Wang Chiang over some hot burning coals. So, I've been rereading the book this week. I watched it last year for my pilgrimage, and I will confess, when I was a much younger fan, I didn't understand why there was controversy about towns of Wang Chiang. I was just taking as read that it was a funny story with a witty script and an interesting setting, and I wasn't looking too deep under the covers. It really wasn't until last year, which is the first time that I watched the story in about a decade, that I realized how much the culture has shifted and how much expectations on people have shifted. And I suddenly realized, how did I not notice some of this problematic material when I was 11 years old? And reading the book now, this has always been one of my favorite novelizations, but rereading it this week has almost become an exercise in drudgery because for every good turn of phrase that Terence has... And as we'll discuss, I think he does mute a lot of the more objectionable parts of Robert Holmes' script. Not all, but some of the objectionable parts. There are still parts of the book that make me very uncomfortable today here in 2022. So I'd love to hear from you guys. What was your original reaction to the book back in the day? And what has the experience been like rereading it now in today's world? Would you like to go, John? Okay, well... um. I'm looking back at this and I'm trying to recall my initial memories are not really of the novelization. That would have, I would have, um, uh, that would have come at a time when I was pretty much devouring the novelizations in a rapid, in this sudden stretch of enthusiastic fandom in about 1982 when I was just devouring any, any who book I could get a hand, hand on. So I don't recall the Talons one standing out. I do remember watching it for the first time or two on, on the screen when I would have been about 11 years old. Again, didn't question it. It was an entertaining story. It was creepy. It had some great cliffhangers. I can still remember the, watching that the uh, the part four cliffhanger with um of, with with Greel and Mister Sin just going away in the in the, in the carriage and, and laughing insanely. That made a real mm-hmm. impact on me. I, I at that point I think in the the early eighties it just didn't register, um and it's like it just tells you just how much people will just take this stuff for granted. I remember what was interesting to me though is that. In terms of the reaction to the book, I remember people being quite aware of the racial aspects in the mid-90s. I remember us being at um, the Visions convention in uh, Chicago with uh, David Maloney, and he was talking to his panel about that, and they were just, he was discussing the situation there, and they were basically, basically saying, yeah, that was a bit much. I wish I had cast, uh, wish I had cast an Asian actor as, as Chang, and they're being, oh, wow. being with awareness that it was a problem, but also no one was making no one was pushing back against the idea. It was just sort of a tacit, slightly embarrassed acceptance of, yeah, we did stuff like that in the 70s. And it's, it's, it seemed to me that it's only been in recent years that there have been people sort of pushing back against the idea that Talons is racist. That developed later. There was sort of a period, a period in which it was people were aware and um, recognized the problems and didn't get quite so defensive. Now it seems that I think I don't know whether this is again a cultural shift that people are are much more defensive about it than they were in the '90s and early 2000s. Um, when it comes to the novelizations, I I found um, going back and, and looking at it there, there was a I, I had a re, I, I had a real sense at the time that it, I mean that it was yet one of the 15 Terrence Dix books I read in the space of a month and a half or whatever it was. <laughs> So it was not like the fifteen Terence Dix books that he wrote in the space. <laughs> <laughs> but I, so I, I remember at the time thinking um, that he was 
it was it was one of the ones where it reminded me a little bit of the stuff that Terrence would do later. Like my sense of, of Terrence's career was that there was a time where it said Terrence was writing novels while you wait, and um, uh, and that there were that. And that there was a period where he, he was not putting in a lot of detail or embellishment or or indeed more indeed much beyond the word the basic word count, um, uh, but then but then later on in the uh, later eighties, probably around the time of the Inferno novelization, he got a second wind, and I remember when I when I reread this book years ago, I remember thinking that this reads more like Terence's second wind or possibly the tail end of his first wind, rather than rather uh, rather than um. Uh, what it actually is, which is interesting, which is that it is a book in the middle of a stretch where Terence is writing, is to a fair extent cranking the books out now, but he's really putting an effort in on this one. So in hindsight now, I can see that he's he's actually putting a lot more care and craft and detail into this book than into the ones around it. And I'm, I'm actually more impressed by the novelization in that respect now than I was as a kid. Yeah, just to give you the numbers, he did eight books in 1977 target only had three authors to publish in 1987 ian martyr had one friend of the podcast philip hinchcliffe had two and terence did the other eight so that's eight books in a year and yet this comes right after his shortest book deadly assassin which is only 116 pages two months later out comes this book which is 100 and i think 142 pages i think and it's a very lengthy and rich especially considering it was his eighth book of the year he could have been forgiven for mailing it in and falling asleep on his keyboard i have the definite impression that um uh, terence has a lot of respect for probably bob holmes and definitely for this script and he has some care for it he treats it with some care um which is kind of lovely to read in a novelization because you know why would you do that they're going to pay you anyway who cares but no i'm going to do i'm going to do justice to this as best i can and um those differences from what was on screen um where there might be a little thing that didn't quite make sense or that wasn't completely explained to the viewer and um, he's right in there going like, let me explain about that, about World War VI. You know, like, let me explain why Lightfoot is okay to be in, in the house with um, Leela, even though it's late at night and she's a lady. Oh, so, right. Um, it, it's just things like that where he's just, his eyeball has gone, I can just sort of improve on that. Um, yeah. So, um, so yeah, it's just, just a kind of feeling of respect or care, which is really nice, it's actually. I got a sense of Terrence script editing a little bit here. I mean, he doesn't. Yes, it's not. Well, a he can't help himself. Yeah. That's part of it. <laughs> it's yeah. It's not a story like he, where he has significantly overhauled it. Like as I mentioned in the uh, Abominable Snowman, one where he is uh, fixing characterization problems, plot problems, and um, cutting out like major chunks of padding there. But I have the sense that he is he is putting more care into um uh, into tidying it up than he would otherwise. This is actually, I found this from a, res from a resource that has the word counts in the book. This is uh, the, the longest uh, Tom Baker era book that Terrence wrote. Um, understandably, it's a six-parter, but in some of the other cases, you could get a six-parter down under 30,000 words. This is uh, 34,000 words. And the only other book that he did around that time that was even close to as long was Brain of Morbius, which he oh, wow. obviously had a personal interest in as well. That's also over 30,000 words. Uh, so he's definitely, rather than um, just just trying to zoom through it and just put it on the page, he is embroidering a lot. I wonder how much of it might also be the fact that this is a story set in the past, so he has a real setting, or at least a familiar fantastical I, setting. I was really struck by his um, his ability to describe um, sort of behind the scenes things at the theatre and stuff like that. And I thought, has he got the lady book, the ladybird book? of Victorian music hall theatres that he's drawing on, or just, just general knowledge stuff. But it, it really struck me. I thought, oh, you know, he's gone out and done some research. Wow. Yeah. I mean, this, there's that real sense there. He will put in whole slabs of, of just detailed description of bits of the theatre. Um, he, he, he has described even the, the chase scene in uh, episode two when uh, Wang Chang is running through the theatre itself. Uh, he d he describes the movements of the, around the stage in detail, and he it, this is a little thing that I noticed from the infotext. Yeah. That whole sequence was basically made up by the director. Um, it was oh. expanded from the uh, from what was in the script. He doesn't just stick with what Bob scripted. He has watched the episode and worked from that. Yeah, yeah it is clear that he has he has seen it and recently. And I assume he could. 
I don't know, somebody, you'll have to figure out the timing. Could he have seen it on television before writing the novelization, or did they give him the tape or something? But you really get the impression that. That it was um, fresh in his mind or something like that, yes. Yeah, and again, that's a bit of extra effort that he didn't necessarily have to put in. I was grappling with the timing when I was writing my script for the second half of this episode, which you'll hear shortly, because mm-hmm. Talons finishes airing in April 77. This book comes out in November 77. And of course, it wasn't written in November. It probably would have had to go to press at least three months earlier. So this would have been written on one of the tighter turnarounds for any Target book. Wow. I think it might have been a case where he saw the, saw the episode and just went, right, I'm having that, and just started <laughs> typing as soon as he could or whatever. That would make some sense there. But again, the other thing that I noticed, I mean, Terrence always tinkers with the dialogue. I mean, he will rephrase things to, um, uh, he will rephrase things to make them clearer on the page where something would have been expressed by the actor non-verbally or whatever. He will, he will, he tinkers with a lot, with pretty much every line there, but he makes an effort, I think, to preserve, um, Robert Holmes's turns of phrase and the memorable bits are, are all still there. But even with the dialogue, he is still, again, trying to improve on little things. There's a moment there which I adored, which is in his one, one of the very first scenes um, uh, where, where, where Jago and Chang are being introduced. I'm going to see if I can find the lines there. Um, Jago, of course, begins this effusive speech about, about Chang's performance, going, oh, wonderful, sir, wonderful. Words fail me. To which um, on screen, uh, Chang's response is just, uh, you're most generous. Whereas on pa- on paper, the 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 way in which um, uh, Terence phrases it is most unusual. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> oh, I have to remember that one. That's good. <laughs> yeah, he's he's put in like lots of little details like like that where he is clearly um trying to um uh, trying to just enrich what what was already there as opposed to simply transcribe it, which I was I was very impressed by. I wonder if I mean somebody more knowledgeable about target novelizations than I would could probably figure this out but I actually wonder if it was a mistake he just went at it and he just sort of naturally did writery things and then you know 30,000 words in he thought what am I doing I don't have to be doing this <laughs> but you know it was then it was too late um you know and he'd written it in that style and he had to finish it in that style well yeah I mean you can see the style shift as it goes along in fact though in terms of just how much of this embroidery he does I mean he starts out with lengthy um uh, Descriptions. I mean, even uh, the police sergeant gets a little character moment about how he's going to deal with things in proper order and so forth. The kind of um, uh, just like character note that you just don't get in the Planet of the Daleks novelization, which he'd written uh, a little while before then. <laughs> That's a great uh, phrase. Right. The kind of what did you say? The, the kind of detail which you just the kind don't of get detail in the of the... that you don't just don't get in the Planet of the Daleks novelization. Yes, but I mean, <laughs> you, get, you get things like a lengthy explanation of why um. Uh, of why Lightfoot is actually working as a police pathologist when he clearly has a large amount of money available and a, and a nice house. This is not a guy who has to be uh, doing uh, d- dabbling with corpses, but in the, but he basically gets a, a little bit of background which explains why he doesn't want to be um, just working in Harley Street treating what's that phrase silly woman, women with the vapors whatever it is yes which uh, which got Kate tackles up as I recall too but it was um. Uh, but it, but the idea that he's, he's he's rationalized these things and come up with 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 what explaining what could be character holes, not just plot holes. Which that's an unusual level of attention to detail. I mean, for for any of the novelization writers around that time. And it's a very small point. It's only four or five words, but those four or five words speak volumes because he's really been thinking about these characters as he goes in a way perhaps the original writer did not. You know, the the original writer we know was basically typing hell for leather, and um, just. I mean, the, the the stories on the DVD about just how late poor Robert Holmes was trying to get these scripts in, where they had to start shooting uh, without even having scripts for parts five and six, as I recall. They were that, they were, he was oh, wow. working that close to the wire because he had to fill in us fill this in as an emergency uh, replacement script. So it was. So um, this was a replacement for uh, Robert Banks Stewart's foe from the future. So this was a replacement script, and yet it, it comes across as a very uh, highly polished. Uh, yes. It's got some of Holmes's more vivid dialogue and insults, and that's the point I want to touch on next, the language in this book compared to the language on TV. But before we do that, I want to go back a little bit and talk about what's problemat- problematic about the TV material. So this is a story, of course, that casts John Bennett as a Chinese immigrant to London, and there are still people who defend this story as not being a racist story, which I think is increasingly a not 
tenable position, but there are still folks out there trying to defend the story as right and proper. Uh, so their argument is that you could not cast an Asian actor in London in 1976 or 77 to play a major starring role, which is what Lee San Chang is for five of the six episodes in the serial, and that it has to be John Bennett in ill-fitting makeup. Now, Kate, that is not quite true, is it? Um, there's plenty of Asian actors around uh, who are who. I made myself a little list of them uh, who have the same kind of length of experience in television as John Bennett. Uh, so I don't. It's difficult to accept the idea that oh, there just wasn't anybody else, and I'm I don't believe there was a. Um, an audition period. I don't think they thought, oh, we must try to find an Asian person. Um, oh dear, nobody's quite working out. We'll cast John Bennett. I think they probably thought, I, I know who would be great for this role, my old friend John Bennett, because he's been in lots of things that I've directed or produced or whatever. Uh, and in fact, John Bennett is, is terrific in the role. It's one of the redeeming virtues of the role is that he at least gives a really good performance. Uh, despite the fact that he's wearing about a kilogram of plate <laughs> hanging off the front of his head. Um, yes. the, the, blue, the, the Blu-rays are merciless on that. Oh, God. You can see, you can see <laughs> some, of the, things, some of the things. He has made the mistake of raising an eyebrow and his entire forehead is wrinkling. Oh, no. <laughs> it's, a, it's a catastrophe. And yet the, the, the worst thing about it is that um, that's not even the biggest problem. Um, like that's the most obvious, conspicuous visual kind of um, embodiment, if you like, of the story's racism. Say that they beamed in an Asian guy into the role. Um, and I'll, Sorry, I've tripped over myself because I keep think, trying to think of a way to sneak in Tony Ten. No, it's Tony Ten, I found out, into this conversation, but it's only because he's cute. I have no idea whether he would have been any good. The, the actor who played Lee... I have I have a uh, a whole thing about Lee, but I think it's irrelevant to this conversation. I do think he's a good example of a, an Asian actor who clearly has chops, though he hasn't. We haven't. We don't get him to hear him deliver any dialogue. No, I want to hear line. him speak because I want to know if 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 like his accent is not too um de, you know confusing. Bloody cast him as bloody Chang. Because the the bits that he does get to do, like, basically his reaction when he sings, sees Wen Chiang or his whole death scene, this guy's got chops. He could. He's really good. Yeah. So. Uh, again, you know, a redeeming feature, but give him some bloody lines, people. Anyway, yeah. let me start again in a more coherent fashion. Even though the yellow face on Chang is like the most obvious visual symbol and the one that ev of, of racism and the one that everybody discusses, because you can hardly miss it. Um, but say you beamed in an actual Asian actor into that role somehow or other, um, because and you would still have a story in which the Chinese are, they fit into this long running stereotype. Like it's a century old stereotype that was created to put Chinese people and specifically Chinese immigrants down. Um, you know, like it, well, it didn't just accidentally happen, this stereotype. It's quite deliberate. What are Chinese immigrants? They are weird. They are cruel. They're criminals. They're, what does it say on the back of the novelization? Is that where Devious, I got that from? Yeah. They're crafty, which means they can lie to you and uh, they're very, very cunning. Um, Again, the inscrutable thing. Yeah, the whole inscrutable bloody thing. Um, so you're still going to have a story that's racist up to its. Um, it began thick eyeballs. It began thick. <laughs> Right? He says epicanthic eyebrows on screen, and then Terence fixes this slightly to epicanthic eyelids, which almost makes sense now, but it um, doesn't quite. Um, so you're a bit stuck with it, really. I mean, if somebody said, Kate, we will give you a million dollars if you sit down and novelize Talents of Wang Chai, and I said, well, I could really use a million dollars. Thank you. Um, I'm going to have to novelize this now. I can't fix it. I can't fix the story. It's about the tongue. It's about weirdness and exoticness and all of these things. I must quickly add in a footnote, though. Um, there may be people listening to this who are feeling very uncomfortable because they love this story and they feel like what I'm saying is you are a bad person and no one should like you because this story is so racist. Uh, but the awful truth is that I really like Pyramids of Mars. Um 
and that's not as racist as talents, but it ain't good. So, uh, you know, it has to be said, you can have things that you like, that you acknowledge their flaws, that you recognise what's wrong about them, uh, and you're still a good person. <laughs> I think what I should talk about is, you know, you were brought up a little earlier, the idea that Terence tones down some of the more overt racism. And yes. specifically, there's where the Professor Lightfoot comes out with a, uh, an epithet which I'm not going to repeat. Um, but uh, Terence has taken that out and put in just the word Chinese. There were some Chinese people there. And um, I was thinking quite a lot about why he did that. Uh, and I wrote a little list to myself of like, okay, well, is it, first of all, outright racial slurs are not appropriate for children? And we know that this book's supposed to be read by the intelligent 14-year-old. So just as he has carefully erased sex workers from the book, um, uh, yes. you know, like, he's, he's quite, he knows that it wouldn't be appropriate for them to have to, for there to be sex workers. So he says the women being kidnapped by Chang are dock workers, factory girls, cleaning women, um, a waitress at a gambling bar, just so that we know that there's nothing, you know, more untoward going on. So could it just be that he thought, look, you can't put that kind of language in front of kids. That's a really good point about the language, because I had covered the Brain of Morbius book a few mm -hmm. weeks back. That was episode 33. Also written by Robert Holmes, Brain of Morbius has some really sharply worded insults, the kind of insults that you would like to say in polite company, but you can't. You can't go around saying things like squalid brood of harpies or that palsied harridan. It went from case of Andrasani, you fessinine bag of slime. Oh. You've got to go and get the dictionary to find out what the hell fessinine means. <laughs> Robert Holmes loves those phrases. He loves those insults. My God. So when Terence adapts Brain of Morbius, he, lives, he leaves in every one of those insults word for word. He leaves in palsied Harrod and he leaves in squalid brood of harpies. Not only that, flash forward seven or eight years, when he novelizes Caves of Androzani, he not only leaves in Fessenine Bag of Slime, he capitalizes Fessenine. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> what, does, think, what does that mean? I think he's suggesting it's like some sort of alien term or something like that. Rather well, than he, that. I mean, he also thinks that Chocos come from Mars in that book, so it's very, <laughs> very inexplicable. But. Yeah, but it's interesting that he's... Go, sorry, um... It's interesting that he's toning down the language in this one, not just in lines like that, or even in some of the insults. But um, I mean, one of the ones that I regret missing was the, des the description of, Ch of Casey as being a lovely bloke, but about as, as about as sharp as the corners of a round table. <laughs> Which again, you could <laughs> use, but, yes. but he's trimmed that bit. And but he's also cut a couple of the descriptive phrases that are in the script that are not not in any way insulting or racially offensive. They're just too much. Like the the character of the ghoul who turns up, the the old woman who fi helps find the floating body, who has that incredible speech about who never seen anything like that in all my puff. That's been massively trimmed down from on screen. They've lost all the sort of oh make all sick that would <laughs> kind of a. Uh, and the character has been gender swapped as a male for the novelization to make it a little less ghoulish. Yeah, it must I it must be like that. It's even more horrific coming out of the mouth of a woman. She's actually my favorite character, except for Lee, obviously. <laughs> but that's only because yes. I think he's cute. Um, <laughs> embarrassing, but true. But no, I think the ghoul is the the best thing in it by far. She only's on on screen for about four seconds, and I'm just like, oh, that ah! I wish I had come up with that myself. Just be, the ability to walk off with the scene. She, absolutely, I've taken the story. Everyone else can go home now. Good grief! What a <laughs> that character needs a six-season big finish box set. So <laughs> and well, I will write stories there. She <laughs> just goes around, and she's never actually involved in Doctor Who action and science fiction. It's just that she always gets to comment on it, where it's really disgusting. So basically, a companion then. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! The girl is a companion. <laughs> oh yeah! There we go. There's your, there's your next big finish uh, audio novel pitch. <laughs> it's, it's Doctor Who and the Ghoul. You see this? Can you imagine? Oh, God, it's picturing her in a double act of Tom Baker's. <laughs> I, I want to come back to my list. I want to come back to oh, my yes, list. Oh, yes, yes. Okay. So, the, my first, so my first theory to recap about why he might take that out, and I think certain other things as well, is that it's not for children. 
you have to ask yourself, now, why is a racial slur not appropriate for children? But let's put that thought aside. Um, I recently read Dale Smith's Black Archives uh, book on talents. And yes. um, he was very interesting because he talks directly about that line that uh, the Terence shifts. Um, he, he, he's talking about the idea that um, Britain at the time is very aware of race. It's thinking about race a lot. It's thinking about immigration a lot. And this is reflected in television. So you get Mind Your Language and Love Thy Neighbour and all these shows where everybody is very embarrassed and confused about immigrants. But it's hilarious, so don't worry too much about it. You know, um, but uh, he 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 argues that Terence's understanding of racism or racial epithets is sophisticated because he doesn't take out just the outright slur, but he takes out inscrutable as well. He's thinking, yes. you know, I understand what this means. I understand how this is an insult and it connects to the whole stereotype. So I thought that was super interesting. Um, so that's another possibility. Um, but the third thing on my list was Robert Holmes has said the quiet part out loud, or perhaps rather Professor Lightfoot has said the quiet part out loud. It's okay to have tongs running around throwing hatchets, but when somebody actually comes out and says it, and I am... Um, my strange brain connected to, of all things, Dr. Terrible's House of Horrible from 2001, which was a TV show that parodied, for some reason, Hammer Horror movies. And there's a parody of Fu Manchu, um, which is also clearly a parody of Talons of Wang Chiang. Mm. And, um, this is the one that has Mark Gatiss in yellow face as Hangman Chang. That was so weird. Oh, Mark, how could you? <laughs> well, no, he's like, it's, it's very complicated because he's taking the piss out of the yellow face. So you think, whoa, I don't even know what to think about this. But he, there is a Chinese, I think, actor, Paul Courtenay Hugh, whose name I have just massacred. He plays Deep Ando in Sleep No More. What a connection. But in this thing, he plays... Inspector Fong and Inspector Fong cannot shut up about how devious and um, bizarre the these Chinese devils are, and he just keeps talking about it all the time. So you've got this Chinese guy standing there in in um, you know a police dress or whatever, and he won't stop talking about it. And everyone in the show is getting more and more uncomfortable. This is how I remember it. Anyway, I know I was just about coming out of my skin, and I thought this is brilliant. He's saying the quiet part out loud. And it's really hard to listen to. So anyway, I thought maybe that's the problem. You can't have Lightfoot just come out and say what everybody's kind of thinking. Like you can show the stereotypes, but you can't actually acknowledge that. You can't, you can't, yeah, you can't just say it. So that's the end of my list. Although point four is that in the novelization, Lightfoot's mum is referred to by Chang as a foreign devil woman. Uh, which I thought was pretty bloody good. So I thought at least in the book, um, Chang gets to get one back. <laughs> that was a point that I wanted to make about the character of Chang. Even though Chang is problematic because there are zero heroic or sympathetic Chinese characters in the piece, if you compare the way that Tom Baker acts during Chang's death scene, he treats Chang with respect. He pays him a very high compliment. In fact, in the book, Terence even doubles down on the compliment, makes mm. it longer and more glowing, mm. versus the way he treats Greel, who's European, who's the real bad guy in part six. The doctor and Tom Baker are openly dismissive of Greel and treat him in a much less respectful way. So that's almost but not quite a saving grace to the story because the doctor treats Chang as a worthy adversary and he treats Greel as a joke. And that is one small point in favor of the character of Chang as a non-racist stereotype. It's a small point, but I think, but it is, it is an important point. Yeah. Well, the, uh, the thing about Chang though, is that he is played as a character, which I found, which I find is some, um, uh, interesting. He's not just like many of the others are design are many other characters. In this are largely there to be colorful stereotypes. Chang is given motivation. He's given moments of pathos. I mean, I, I wonder at what point in the script Robert Holmes decided to uh, not have not kill Chang off at the end of part four. I suspect he might have been he might have improvised that final scene in order in order to keep because he needed more stuff in part five. But the idea that he is he is 
in the end, humanizing the character, I think, is one of the things in the character's favor. Unfortunately, the real problem with this character is that fundamentally, no matter, you can't get away from the fact that he is specifically Fu Manchu. And while um, you can argue the, uh, argue the racial awareness and sensitivity of Talons itself, uh, unfortunately, you can't argue the fact that Fu Manchu itself, the original, was straight up deliberately racist. I mean, it was um, uh, de de deliberately, the, uh, the author, Sax Romer, was, when he created Fu Manchu, was deliberately trying to cash in on yellow peril fe fears. He, has, he mm -hmm. acknowledged as much there, that this was entirely making money off of the, 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 the trendy suspicion of immigrants at the time there. And so you really can't get away from that. In this. That was another point that I wanted to raise about Talons. Uh, Talons is not just racist towards the Chinese. There's one Irish character in Talons, and he's a drunk. Now, Terrence yes. does remove the phrase pixelated leprechaun from the text, and it's not in the novelization. Yeah. But Robert Holmes was not coming from a good place towards Irish immigrants in London in the 1890s either. And then, John, certainly you and I can speak to this. There's one Jewish character in Talents, and she's often spoken about but never seen. Bearing in mind that the East End in the 1890s was the Jewish neighborhood in London, you would have had a lot of Jewish people in the theater. Charles Dickens goes into this in nauseating detail, unfortunately, in Great Expectations. Uh, Mrs. Samuelson, who was the wardrobe director for the theater, uh, let's play a clip right now and listen to how Robert Holmes describes her on television. Casey, I'm about to repair for half a foot of port. Mrs. Samuelson in yet? I've not seen her, Mr. Jacob. Oh, you tell her I want the girls fairly smartening up. They look like a fit-up company last night. One of them had a Jacob's ladder as long as my arm. Look at that. You tell her. Yes, Mr. Jacob. Told her. What? Mrs. Samuelson. Told her what she said. Oh, no. Didn't like it. I don't want to hear that, Casey. I'm not concerned with what Mrs. Samuelson likes. She mentioned money matters. She wants a word with you. The woman's a bloodsucker. She's trying to ruin me. Now, Don't tell said... me, Casey. I'm an artiste. Every night at this time, I feel like an old war horse scenting the smoke of the battlefield. As the house fills, the blood starts tingling through my veins. My public is out there waiting for me. I can't talk about money at a time like this. You don't do anything, Mr. Jago. I, I announce the acts. I count the tickets. I smile at people. You have no idea the strain it puts on a fellow. Furthermore, she spent 17 and threepence on the wardrobe last week. Oh, come on, I missed this completely. Far out, Bob, pull yourself together. Now, Terence had famously removed the anti-Semitic stereotype from Web of Fear and de-ethnicized Julius, quote-unquote, Silverstein. Yes, Emil Julius. I had never noticed the Mrs. Samuel thing before, even going back to 1985 when I would have first seen the story. I caught that for the first time last year, 2021, and my uh, my eyebrows almost uh, popped out of their accustomed place. Um, <laughs> I'll bet. So I then immediately pulled the novelization out, and I went looking through the Part 4 material to find out what Terrence did with poor Mrs. Samuelson. She ain't there. He cuts out every reference to Mrs. Samuelson from the story. So he might not have been able to save the Chinese portrayal and he makes Casey a lot more sympathetic and a lot less pixelated but Mrs. Samuelson is gone from the text. Which is interesting wow. because in the case of um, uh, in the case of uh, Julius Silverstein becoming Emil Julius, he simply renamed the character and tweaked a few lines rather than losing it entirely. I think what might have happened in terms of losing um, the Mrs. Samuelson references completely from this thing might have been another factor in play, even more than uh, toning it down, which is that this is my pet theory here. The beginning of part four is when Terence suddenly hits his deadline panic and realizes that he is massively over length in this book. Mm. I mean, like I said, um, uh, around this time, he'd been managed to get the uh, distilling the, the books down to a fine art and that he was able to get an entire six parter down to in some cases, a bit under 30,000 words, like in Plan of the Daleks, where he will just, he just zooms through the whole thing, doesn't even break 30,000 words to get a, um, to get it all in there, which is quite a feat given that a script, uh, just the dialogue transcription could be like 19,000 words or something like that. And I'll point out that you are on camera with me. You are not only holding up the Talons novelization, you are also holding up the Planet of the Daleks novelization. When you turn it sideways, it disappears. That's how thin it is. <laughs> yes. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. I mean, it's literally, I mean, you can see uh, there's, there, there's a significant difference in the length. And also the print is a lot bigger in Planet of the Daleks. But with them, uh, what, what's happened is I think um, uh, what Terrence is going through and knows roughly by this point, he's done a few of these books. He knows where he should be in terms of his word count. I'll go by pages rather than word count. But let's say the, books, the book at this point, usually around a bit under 130 pages, the halfway point of the book should be somewhere around page 65. In right. Planet of the Daleks, it is literally page 65 is the end of episode three. Now, the first half for a few episodes sometimes are a bit longer. You have more detail in them, so it would be a few pages over. Let's say somewhere around page 70, you'd, ex- you'd look up and expect, okay, I'm, if I'm on target, I'm about halfway through my book. Then with Wang Chiang, oh dear, I'm on page 80. <laughs> and starting at the beginning of episode four, suddenly, not just the Mrs. Samuelson scenes, but a lot of other scenes... Terence just starts pruning anything he can. A lot of the uh, random dialogue or, or di- digressions that are going on in the scenes between the Doctor and Lightfoot in Part 4 are gone. Pretty much any, all, all the backstage chatter with, Jay, with Jago and Casey is trimmed down to about two lines. Uh, the, even, going into, even going into Part 5, when Jago meets Lightfoot, like chunks of that dialogue have been streamlined, simplified. He is just basically, he's stopped going, right, I'm going to get every line of, of Bob Holmes' script in here. Even if I tinker with it, I want pretty, I've had pretty much every line in up to this point. Now he's cutting. And so Parts 4 and 5 are just being, just being pruned around the edges. Again, script edited rather than completely thrown out. But still, everything is being compacted and trimmed and trying to squeeze in there. And I identify with this so much. <laughs> in my last book, I got into uh, basically part three of four and suddenly realized I was already about 10,000 words over length. I'm still 10,000 words over length, but I would have been even <laughs> more. But my part, the action that I had planned out for part three, about half of it just suddenly disappeared back into the ether from whence it came. It was never written. I just had to keep simplifying as I was going and streamlining whatever I could just to have a prayer of getting close to my word count. You can then see where Terrence begins to relax again about his word length. He's, he figures he'll only be a little bit over length. And that's at the very end of part five. The sequence with Jago and Lightfoot trying to escape through the dumbwaiter which was absolutely literal padding on screen. It's a yes. wonderful scene, but it is literally there just to add an extra couple minutes to part five. And Terrence does not cut that. He keeps it. And either it's because he had by that point relaxed that he was only going to be about 34,000 words long, so not too bad. Yeah. Or it was just too good to cut. But either way, he has, he has, he has loosened up by that point there once he's got himself back roughly in the vicinity of, the, of his target word length. He's still 4,000 words, but what the heck. I would like to think that Terrence made the conscious decision to cut that little bit of casual anti-Semitism out. Now, I agree with you that, yes, he has to do a lot of trimming in the back half of the story. Parts 1 through 3 are 74 pages. Parts 4 through 6 are 59 pages. So, yes, he has to trim. But I I would like to give him the benefit of that, uh, considering that he would transcribe all those insults from Brain of Morbius and Caves verbatim. He removes all the nasty epithets and gives you the sense of the insult rather than the insult itself from talents. He's already doing a lot of, um, I don't want to use the word whitewashing for a variety of reasons, but he's doing a lot of um, making it more acceptable. You can say these lines in the playground without getting pulled off and sent to the principal's office. I would like to think the Mrs. Samuel thing was a conscious decision on Terrence's part to save us. But uh, again, it could have been just an expedient, but let's, I want to give him the benefit of the doubt. Yeah. It's quite possible that it was um, a a deliberate, um, a, toning down at the very least, and even before he started going, right, we can just lose that entirely. The, uh, the elephant that's not quite in the room here is that there's, we've had to discuss talents a couple of times before, and a number of people have remembered an interview with Terrence Dix where he talks a little bit about talents. Um, none of us have been able to find this. We think it might have been in an old Doctor Who magazine special or something like that, but there was an interview where he talked about um, uh, the... Uh, it talked about the racial content in um, uh, in Talons and and toning down um, uh, and toning down some of what Bob Holmes had done. I can't if I could. This is something I've been looking for to try to find. But I seem to recall him talking about um, uh, Bob's own attitudes there, and that he would he came out with things that he would just think would, would be were unacceptable there. In my case, um, when it comes to um, uh, the original scripts, I still want to also find out. On a on a complete tangent, I um, the um uh, 
the, the legendary lost uh, Robert Holmes script for season 23, which was going to have oh. been titled Yellow Fever. And how to cure it. Yes, yes. Yes, um, which is set in Singapore. But uh, yeah, <laughs> Yellow Fever is, um, uh, I mean, it, this has suggested to people all sorts of strange tropical diseases and whatnot there. Unfortunately, Yellow Fever is an African disease, which is not within like 6,000 miles of Singapore, where the story is going to be set. So it seems hard not to conclude that uh, Robert and and or Eric Sayward are having a bit of a joke at uh, at um, John Nathan Turner's in its extreme enthusiasm for filming in Singapore, and that is just in fact a rude joke on, on that. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yes, so it's it's very suspicious, and I've never quite had that confirmed or denied or anything How like that rude. there. But. It just, it's one of it's one of the things where I get the feeling that Terence was aware that uh, this would have been a bit of a problem and was approaching the approaching Wing Chiang with a de- deliberate desire to to um, tone these things down um, and sort of steer away from anything that that Bob might have put his foot in. And not to give Eric Sayward credit for anything, but when the season twenty three Trial of a Time Lord Blu Ray box set came out several months ago. It includes the original Robert Holmes draft script for part 13, and then, of course, the unused Eric Sayward draft for part 14. What's interesting is that Robert Holmes dies, and Eric Sayward rewrites half of part 13. So what goes out as part 13 by Robert Holmes is really part 13 by Robert Holmes and Eric Sayward. All the trial scenes were written by Holmes. All the scenes in The Matrix were originally written by Holmes, Sayward ditches all that and rewrites the Matrix scenes. In the Matrix scenes that Robert Holmes wrote, which you can find on the Blu-ray, and thankfully not on television or on the actual video, there was a character, I think it may have been uh, one of uh, the Valley Yard's alter egos, there's a character who uses ethnic slurs for both Chinese people and Italian people in the same line of dialogue, as if he's Jack Waltz and the Godfather. Eric Sayward prevented us from ever having to hear that line with our ears or see it with our eyes. So even up until his very last minutes, Robert Holmes was still trying to get digs at as many immigrant ethnic groups as he could in 1890s London. It, it does become a little bit like your, your, your racist uncle. Like, you love him, but shut up. <laughs> it's, again, it's the, it's the grandfather thing there where it's like, I mean, I've had this with them, with elderly relatives who come out with stuff which they think is just being just being funny or sarcastic or or a bit grumpy. And you just have to sort of go, no, Shut sorry, up. I love you. And that's the thing is that it's a that's the central problem that people have to keep wrestling with the talents is that it is it is a it is a a funny, sharp script by a talented writer, which just keeps keeps stomping on so many toads that it's just not actually fun in that respect, which is... Um... Hey, I want to talk about the Chinese ruffians. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yes, okay. please. Right, now there is a bizarre moment. It is bizarre in the television thing. One of the things that you can do, people often uh, will say, well, what I think is happening in, in talents, the television thing, is that these characters are expressing the racism of their time. It was accepted that, you know, it's the Victorian area. What, what do you want? Uh, and and we are supposed to understand, oh, you shouldn't say that kind of thing, but, you know, it's the Victorian era, so they do. But to have that work, you've got to have the Doctor respond to it to tell us, to indicate to us, the viewer, that that's not okay, that that's stupid or um, or wrong. Or, you know, he doesn't have to punch them in the face. That might be a bit over the top. Dr Disco from the Fairford Club. Obviously, one aspires to membership, but to actually be considered for... Who who let this creature in here? On your feet, girl, in the presence of your betters. He's human. 31 years of age, low in iron. Yeah, that was pretty convincing racism for an extraterrestrial. My thoughts exactly. But... You just have to have that. And there's a couple of places that are really uncomfortable where there's a race, uh, there's some racism and the doctor just goes along with it. You never get that little underlining of, no, that's not okay. And the, the weirdest one is this because it actually doesn't make any goddamn sense. Uh, Lightfoot has been beaten up by the, the dreaded Tom 
and they he says things are coming to a pretty pass when ruffians will attack a man in his own home and the doctor says completely straight well they were chinese ruffians and you're like what he doesn't even say it as a joke but it doesn't even make any sense it's like a really weird moment but in the book it becomes chinese ruffians by any chance professor and you understand what he is saying is was it the tongue that beat you up professor which is a completely reasonable question, although perhaps slightly stupid to us because we can't afford anybody else to be in it. Um, it's like Mrs. Hudson, who I assume is some sort of invisible robot. Um, <laughs> but um, it, and I thought that's not just, you could argue that this is a fix of a really weird racist moment. Um, but it's also just makes the line make sense now. Like why is, why is he even saying that? I mean, if it wasn't in the middle of a sort of opium den story, which is going to get a bunch of kids beaten up on the playground the, tomorrow morning for looking Asian, you could actually say, even say, that line is not even racist. He's just trying to figure out what's going on. Unfortunately, you know, that's, yeah. that, that's the thing that makes steam come out of my ears is that the kids who were beaten up on the playground the next morning. Um, mm. But but let's not go too far down that yeah. line or else, or blood will come out of my head. One of the interesting okay. points of contrast with that line, though, yeah. is um, uh, I think what they're going for with in terms of Tom, the way Tom plays it on screen is something similar to his deadpan response in Robot to um, when the Brigadier says that naturally England was was chosen to uh, to protect the nuclear codes and the Doctor just says with, with barely, barely raised eyebrow, well, naturally, everyone, all the others are foreigners. Oh, yes, that's exactly the kind of thing that yes. I mean where there's a, there's something that just pulls the carpet out from under the the racist remark or the dubious remark. Yeah. Um, if it was, if it, uh, Tom is, I think, might, might have been trying to play it like sort of I ironic, but it doesn't. But that doesn't really come across quite right, which is the awkward. I don't know. It's, it's I, yeah, I, it's a weird choice. I don't think we will ever know quite what the hell that was all about. But it's another example of how Terence in the novelization manages to take a suspect line and repurpose it and make it a lot more uh, acceptable, if not uh yeah, he, he's able to take a lot of the sting out of stuff. It's awful, too, because you sort of really want to compliment him. Hey, Terence, that was a great idea. Thank you for fixing that line. And then you think, but this book is still really horrible. No! <laughs> you know, you, you can you can fix things a little bit, but you can't really repair it. And, and that's such a shame. It's a novelization and not a wholesale rewrite, of course. Yeah. Well, this is true, and he's a bit stuck with what he's got. Um I wanted to mention there are a couple of absolute cracking lines that I wrote down here, which I, I, I thought were so good. It is no small responsibility to be the servant of a dying god. <laughs> Why did I never write that line? That's so good. And the doctor paused, remembering the future. This is when he's talking about what happened in World War Six and the, the whole business with Reykjavik. I just thought, ah, oh, ha, ha, Terrence, you're so good. Yeah, it's like every so often you'll just throw in a line that make, that makes you go, okay, this this justifies all the transcription around it. This is this is <laughs> this is a writer actually writing and hey, not, yeah, not just rewriting. What if you got like white out? We'll get some liquid paper and we'll just go through the book, whiting out almost everything <laughs> except like two or three really cracking lines. I uh, know. See, no. this is this is that's a good analogy for the problem. Yeah. You, you can't fix it. But in terms of stuff parents is whiting out, that's one of the other things that I've noticed, which is, a, I get it, sort of a motif in the book around this time, just nothing to do with any of the racial aspects. But in terms of stuff that Terence is editing, Terence Dix seems to be having a one-man war on dates in Doctor Who. Like any time that a year is given for something around the around this time, there, if possible, he seems he seems to eliminate it. I mean, in this one here, he's he's cut the reference to um uh, to um uh, having cut to a uh, Lightfoot having come over in seventy three. Uh, he's cut the references to Jack the Ripper, which would date the uh, Victorian end of the story there as as being as being shortly after the, the Jack the Ripper murders. He even yeah. cuts the date of the Harry Champion quote, which is not in fact Harry Champion, but he's but he's cut the, the reference to nineteen twenty. Oh, is, that's right. Yeah, it's like this is the same way in which Terence has managed to get through the Pyramids of Mars novelization without once mentioning 1980. Or he managed to cut every single date reference that could possibly allow you to date Web of Fear. 
He is like single-handedly trying to not pin down the time periods of anything set in recent history. And I don't, I don't know why he's doing this, but it's consistent throughout these books that he is like trying to erase every date he can, except for the 51st century, which he, which he keeps possibly because it's the future. <laughs> I'm imagining Terence novelizing prisoners of the flux where the brigadier who was a lieutenant in world war two suddenly becomes a corporal in 1967 before he becomes a brigadier, presumably the year after that. Uh, so I'm glad that Terrence was not around to fix Chris Chibnall's mistakes. <laughs> oh, that, that's all to me, actually. Um, uh, I had suggested a, a way into patch that thing in that there's basically, basically what we, what we ended up, um, uh, ended up coming up with uh, while we were talking about this, literally, uh, for those who didn't hear my previous broadcast, I am writing a book which is about the founding of UNIT, which had been very carefully dated by ed editor Andy Frank Allen to be in 1972. I had, written, I had written the entire book. I was into the final revisions on this sort of thing. And then Prisoners of Flux airs and shows UNIT active in 1967. <laughs> Even I understood why this was hilarious and terrible. Why I was giggling while watching this episode <laughs> there. And also, at the same time, had a corporal, a, a, a new corporal who had, um, uh, who had um, uh, a voice very similar to Nicholas Courtney's shouting from off screen. A corporal laying in an airstrike to the RAF, which is not what corporals do. Yes. But basically what we have not done here is that once again, uh, Andy Franken Allen has embroidered upon his uh, spectacularly large and complex Lethbridge Stewart family tree. And this is a, a distant cousin or something like that there. It's probably, it'd probably be Archibald Lethbridge Stewart or something like that, or, who's, who's, who, was, who was involved with UNIT at the time there. We then also explained that because of um, the because of the, de the the death of the character in um, in in flux, uh, the the death of the general who's trying to set up unit, that the whole program gets gets basically had its, had his plug pulled on ground for security reasons as a result of this thing. So basically, this basically Ch what Chibnall shows is them failing to set up unit in 1967. That's our story, and we're sticking to it. And you're creating the second unit in 1972, which predates all of the Troughton stories. Yes, more or less, except that the Web of Fear is clearly, is clearly set in 19, 1975 or thereabouts there, except, um, I, again, and Andy Frank Allen has come up with a, with a large and complicated theory explaining dating for this sort of thing, whereas I am much more likely to sort of wave my hand and go, it's the 70s. Or oh, I was going to say, all I had to deal with from the Dead Star was general relativity. You guys are having a really hard time. We've got time dilation here going on. Mm. But because he told me that it was going to be 1972, I wrote the book so it was very specifically grounded in 1972, down to the month. We were able to tie it into things like the Watergate burglary and um, and the and Britain joining the the EEC in 1972, almost to the month. It got this down to so in the context of this book, Terence Dix sort of looked at my thing and just had sort of gotten out, uh, gotten out the whiteout and just sort of wiped out whole pages. <laughs> so, Kate, speaking of lines that you wish you'd written, I have a confession to make. Yep. So Set Piece comes out in 1995, I think, and I am at this point a senior in college, and I was um, taking a fiction writing seminar with American short story writer Stephen Dixon, now deceased. And you had a line in Set Piece that just had me completely aglow and floating six feet above my apartment floor. It's that hypermania, it's infectious. <laughs> Ace is stuck in the past, and you write the line, suddenly the TARDIS did not materialize. I remember that! Yes! I thought it was about the greatest line I'd ever read, so I put it, I put a version of that line into one of my short, I was writing a short story about a prisoner on death row, and I write, suddenly the telephone did not ring with a partner from the governor. So we're reading out this story in class, and Stephen Dixon goes, this is a terrible line, why did you put this in here? I couldn't even Kate Orman properly. <laughs> <laughs> well, what would he know? I was going to say, sucks to be you, Stephen Dixon. <laughs> you did a lot of short stories, but you have novels. Yes. <laughs> You're still writing. Well, is he getting Michael Trout and reading any of his works? I think not. <laughs> no, he's not. <laughs> and then, do you know there is a guilty lurking neuron at the back of my head that says, you stole that off Stephen King, didn't you? And I'm thinking, did I? I don't remember. What did I? What did Stephen King say? Well, I bet you did steal it. You probably stole it. I'm like, oh my god. So hmm. yes, but when Kate steals something, it stays stolen. That's damn straight. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> Though, what a funny story. <sighs> did not affect my final grade, fortunately.
<laughs> good. <laughs> That's good to hear. <laughs> oh dear. Uh, so what else, uh, as we start to wrap up, what else can we say about Talons on television, Talons the book? the And of course, if Talons were to be written today, it would be a very, 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 very different story altogether for a variety of reasons. Yeah, wow. Yeah. Isn't it interesting to try to imagine, okay, well, if you wanted to do essentially the same story again, which elements could you could you take from it uh, and um, they kind of go forward with? Um, and, you know, immediately I started to think about that, okay, foe from the future, this, that, and the other. Um, and and my brain just immediately fell back into Fu Manchu. I thought, oh, I'm not sure I'm not sure it can be done. It's an idea I'm... that Chris Chibnall could have done. If you think about Torchwood, Torchwood is the other side of Talons because Torchwood, Jack Harkness, is from the 51st century. Yes. He's from oh. World War VI. He's a time agent. You could argue that Jack is the guy who should have been sent to the 19th century to track down the uh, fleeing criminal Magnus Greel. You could have had a Torchwood season two or season three story with Jack Harkness flashing back to the towns of Wang Chiang. And because it's Chris Chibnall, he would do it with a lot more ethnic sensitivity. But they had a better idea and they decided to do meat instead. So (laughs) actually... It's interesting because doesn't um uh, t- doesn't um Jack get sent back in time and get recruited by Torchwood in the Victorian era? Yes, that's right. He could have done Victorian Ooh. Torchwood versus Wang Chiang. Oh my god! Uh, but I I think that possibly if you were going to do this story um in in a modern modern uh, modern framework that'd be sensitive, what would perhaps be uh, a um uh, what would perhaps be a way of making it work and the classic have your cake and eat it too is simply to build on build on Chang's role. So what he is, is he starts out as the villain, then turns around as heroic, and he does get to kill his god. Because he's realized that his god is, in fact, a bastard manipulating him all along. And that he, we see his journey from a villain to a hero in that respect. You might be able to, you might be able to have him start out conforming to the stereotype and then tearing that down. Have him played by Tony Ten. No, don't have him played by Tony Ten because I'll tell you what my uh, my evil plan is, right? What happens is Chang kills Grail, then Chang and Lee escape from justice and then they go become buskers in Birmingham <laughs> and, and where they are gay. <laughs> they, they go there and <laughs> they be gay and do crimes. I'm there. I would watch that. Now that's before you started putting in the K-pop dance numbers, though. All right, yeah. let's not talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> I, one of my notes which I should throw in is this. I ad- admire Terence seems so confident writing this. He's got obviously he's got an existing script where somebody's worked out all of the plot points and dialogue and stuff. It, it should be reasonably easy to do this work. But I've been looking at it thinking, did he just start typing? Does he just is he so experienced that he just knows how to sit down with a script next to him and just start writing it onto the, the book page? Or is he going through it, doing planning, like, I want to change this, I must fix that, I'm going to cut this whole page out? Because I, when I back in the day, when you've been very kind about my new adventures, but I was very, very bad. I used to just start typing, and I would get into a pickle an awful lot. I mean, it worked a lot of the time. I got away with it. But um, Dead Star is really different to that because I thought, if I don't carefully plan this, I'm going to be in a real, I'm going to have a real problem with it because I don't have that many words, I don't have that much time, and they're not expecting me to just ramble on about nonsense. So, boy, they're lucky they didn't, aren't they? Um, so I was, just, I was just kind of fascinated by the fact that he seems just so completely in control of what he's doing, and I envied that, and I envied those turns of phrase a lot too. So, yeah. I, th- I think actually there is one last thing that I was wanted to note about in terms of his, his awareness and planning there is that how much he adds to the descriptions of what went on in the 51st century. This is a guy who has thought about not just the story, like sentence by sentence as he's typing, but the backstory. For example, he adds a couple of plot elements. In his telling, the Peking homunculus was actually created to be an assassination weapon. It was designed oh. to kill the children of the Icelandic Alliance commissioner or something like that. Whereas in the, in the actual transcript of the episodes, it's clear it seems to have just malfunctioned. It was a gift and it went malfunctioned. But in this one here, he makes it clear, A, that it was created by Magnus Greel, so that it was so that it's not just a coincidence that these two ended up together, but that he deliberately created this in order to set off World War Six in the first place. And B, 
he then he then establishes why they, that the two of them escaped through time together, and there was and then he also um he also interestingly places Magnus Greel in Peking at the time that he's doing this on on screen. Yes, yeah, the interesting thing is that there is there is an exp- on screen it, it, Magnus Greel is not um uh, is not Chinese. He is as you put it European at base there. He is basically a Joseph Mengele. Who has who has right. fled to ancient ancient China rather than rather than Argentina, um, uh, but this so but in that case there he was already working with the commissioners in Peking as part of their their grand alliance or whatever before this so he has a connection to China in that case whereas on the screen in, in the actual episodes itself the real irony is that in in the episodes itself Chang is or rather Magnus Greel is in yellow face. He is pretending to be Chinese. That's a really good point. Oh, wow. <laughs> hey, even the villain, the villain is doing it. It can't be a good thing. <laughs> yeah. huh. But that's been changed. He's got at least a little more Chinese in the in the novel than he is than he is in the that he is in the actual episodes. Interesting. Well, John, Kate, I want to thank you so much. This has been a blast. This is the longest interview that I've had so far. Oh, and wow. It's been a real a real joy and a real delight. <laughs> What a great pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting us. Thank you. This has been a, a joy just to have a, a, a little bit of fun here. So thanks. And we'll try and get you back on real soon at some point to discuss hopefully a less controversial book. Have a great night. Okay. All right. Cheers. Catch you later. Bye. Bye. Doctor Who and the Talons of Wang Chiang, written by Terence Dix, televised as the Talons of Wang Chiang, teleplayed by Robert Holmes, televised February 1977 through April 1977, published in November 1977. Stepping out of the TARDIS into Victorian London, Leela and the Doctor are confronted by menacing, diabolical horrors shrouded within the swirling London fog. A man's death cry, an attack by Chinese Tong hatchet men, giant rats roaming the sewers, young women mysteriously disappearing. The hideously deformed Magnus Greel, conducting a desperate search for the lost time cabinet, is the instigator for all this evil. Posing as the Chinese god Wang Chiang, Greel uses the crafty Chang and the midget mannequin Mr. Sin to achieve his terrifying objectives. The Doctor must use all his skill, energy, and intelligence to escape the talons of Wang Chiang. Content warning. I am reviewing a book from 45 years ago. Even if this book were written with the best of intentions in its day, language and attitudes change. Some of the words and expressions used in this book, used in many Doctor Who books in the late 1970s, and even into the early to mid-80s, are no longer acceptable or are considered downright offensive, such as the word crafty in the back cover blurb that I just read. Over the course of this podcast, some of those now offensive words will be spoken aloud. They are used strictly because they appear in the book and are discussed here only in a critical sense. Talons of Wang Chiang on TV has issues with racist terminology, poor representation of minorities, and the whitewashing of its lead Asian role. Those are problems, but the script underneath those problems is still widely hailed as one of Doctor Who's best ever. Even Russell T. Davis said so. If I may quote from Wikipedia, take the Talons of Wang Chiang, for example. Watch episode one. It's the best dialogue ever written. It's up there with Dennis Potter by a man called Robert Holmes. When the history of television drama comes to be written, Robert Holmes won't be remembered at all because he only wrote genre stuff. And that, I reckon, is a real tragedy. And that's from Doctor Who's past and now future showrunner. The novelization is by Terence Dix, who so often served as writer Robert Holmes' print muse. 1977, the beginning of Dix's crazy busy period for the target range, Talons was Terence's eighth novelization of the year. Eight. And yet, Talons is a whopper at 142 pages long, though the text starts on page seven, with almost non-existent margins. 
by word count, this may well be Terence's longest book. John told us 34,000 words, and yet he wrote seven others before it for publication all that same year. <laughs> the man's an assassin. The Talents book does a few interesting things, which I'll mention up front here, and then we'll delve into specifics. First, it revels in Holmes's TV dialogue and atmosphere. Page one, or if you will, page seven, opens with several lush paragraphs describing the sights and sounds and smells of the Palace Theatre, as well as setting the scene for 1890s London. It was a tough, savage place, Terence writes. He describes Lee San Chang's act. Terence keeps up this lush prose for pretty much the full run of the book, all 15 chapters, quite unlike his later, late 70s style, when writing more trifling fare like Invisible Enemy or Robots of Death, books that barely top 100 pages. Second, Terence seems to be making some efforts to rub away the underlying racism, whether Holmes intended it or not, of the TV production. Now, Terence can't really fix fundamental things, as John and Kate and I talked about before the break. There were no heroic Chinese characters on TV. They were all villains. But Terence can tweak dialogue to even out our sympathies. Chang says to the doctor in part one, I understand that to you, European gentlemen, we humble Chinese all look alike. An improvement over the TV line. But at the same time, this book was published only about seven months after the TV serial was broadcast, and it seems unlikely that Terence would have been aware of any negative reactions to the story. Any changes that he made were probably in the interest of his very young target-reading audience. The book is set in Victorian London, an era that Doctor Who would revisit quite a bit during the Stephen Moffat years. Terence briefly peeks under the hood of this era at racial and social inequities. The second paragraph is quite instructive. Still on page 7, it was a tough, savage place, this London of the 1890s, a place of contrasts. Victoria was on the throne, and the British Empire covered much of the globe. England was powerful and prosperous, and London was the trading capital of the world. There were those in the theater who shared their country's prosperity, spending gold sovereigns with a free hand, living comfortable lives, with servants to look after them. Yet there were so many more who were short of the money to pay for their next meal, or even for a roof over their heads. However, tonight they were united in a common aim, to forget their troubles and have a thoroughly good time. One burning question that I had about the Talon's novelization going into this reread is how Terence, writing this book almost certainly within weeks, if not months, of the story concluding its original broadcast, is going to adapt Holmes' often clumsy and offensive use of racial stereotypes. Is he, in short, trying to make Chang and the other quote-unquote ethnic characters more sympathetic than they were on TV? Chang, on page 8, has, quote, handsome oriental features, close quote. My understanding is that word is still common in the UK, but has long been considered offensive in the US, and I apologize for its use here. That's a word that I have not spoken aloud since the early 1980s. Casey on page 9 is less flatteringly described as the, quote, skinny little Irish doorkeeper, close quote. On page 13, Casey is described as, quote, reliable enough as a rule, though with a weakness for the bottle. Close quote. Early on, both on TV and in the book, theater manager Henry Gordon Jago says that Lee San Chang's act is so impressive that words fail him. On TV, Chang says, and I will not be doing accents this episode, you are most generous. But in the book, Terence gives him the more sarcastic retort, most unusual. Page 14, through the eyes of the serial's first casualty, Alfred Buller, quote, an English Bobby would know how to deal with that smooth-talking foreigner, end quote, i.e. Chang. An offensive line out of context, though giving Terence the benefit of the doubt, that was written strictly as the POV of an aggrieved character with an axe to grind, rather than authorial voice. During the fight scene on pages 15 through 17, and yes, I have been to that location during one of my trips to London, though I didn't realize where I was standing until I saw the bonus features on the season 14 Blu-ray box set last year, Terence uses the word Chinese five times, and the now hideously dated Chinaman once. 
though the online transcript of this episode is worse, describing the stuntmen's martial arts as, quote, karate or whatever, close quote, which is much more problematic, and where the doctor describes his attacker as, quote, this little man on TV, Terence removes the word little from the book. Page 18, quote, again the crowd laughed, this time at the reference to the habit of opium smoking, undoubtedly widespread among the Chinese population of Limehouse, end quote. The word undoubtedly is doing a lot of work in that paragraph. Page 19, however, reverses the casting of John Bennett. Quote, After all, he, that is Chang, really was Chinese, unlike most Oriental magicians who were usually English enough once the makeup was off. In Chapter 3, Terence removes all of Casey's and Jago's references to Jack the Ripper regarding the missing girls. There is, though, a wonderfully embellished description of Professor Lightfoot on page 30. Professor Lightfoot was a well-known local character, Terence writes. A member of a wealthy upper-class family, he could, if he wished, have had a fashionable practice in Harley Street, but after a spell in the army, he had deliberately chosen to come and work at a hospital in London's East End. Here he could do real and useful work, instead of, as he put it himself, dosing a lot of silly women suffering from the vapors. Worse still, he had taken the post of police pathologist, deliberately involving himself in the crime so common in the area. His aristocratic relations had long ago given up trying to make him see reason. Lightfoot went his own way, and he always would. On page 38, chapter 4, Terence, otherwise faithfully rewriting the scene where Jago and Casey, quote, pleasantly aglow with brandy, search the theater cellar for Casey's ghost, removes the questionable Jago observation that Casey is a, quote, pixelated leprechaun. Now, pixelated does not actually mean drunk, though in context on TV it certainly could have been. The book is better for the absence of that insult. And in the next chapter, page 49, Terrence also removes Jago's insult behind Casey's back about the man being quote, as sharp as the corners of a round table, end quote. Chapter 5, page 42. Terence changes the terrible line, inscrutable. Uh, well, no, I'm not going to say the next word, but it's a really offensive name for people of Chinese origin, and that's spoken only on TV, to the more neutral, well, sort of neutral, mysteriously dead Chinese. Mysterious relating to the manner of death rather than to the Chinese people as a group, I hope he meant to say. On page 45, Terence also removes the TV word enigmatic from an otherwise faithful adaptation of the scene in the cab. However, Terence does keep in the exchange on TV where Lightfoot expresses confusion as to the custom of fireworks at funerals, which the doctor then explains, and Lightfoot defensively but feebly replies, I know that. In that same exchange, Terence tells us that the doctor ignored him, which is one way of handling patronizing cultural attitudes. Chapter 7, page 61. The doctor's infamous, well, they were Chinese ruffians, line on TV, is also completely rewritten. Here, the doctor turns the line into a question asked of the victimized Professor Lightfoot, a way of playing Sherlock Holmes and confirming his suspicion as to who robbed the house. Chinese ruffians, by any chance, Professor? Terence rewrites. In part three, on television, Chang abducts what we're meant to assume is a prostitute, home at dawn after an evening out. The online transcript refers to her as a working woman first, and then changes her name from Teresa to, well, a crude variant on the word prostitute later in the transcript. The transcript is very concerned with correcting geographical errors in the story such as the relationship between Fleet Street and the East End, but is less concerned with these stories' more problematic racial content or insinuations about women. The transcripts are an invaluable sight, don't get me wrong, but it really could use some editorial scrubbing. Meanwhile, in the book, Terence smooths over such insinuations on page 67 by giving this woman a more explicit backstory. Her name is Teresa Hart, and she's a waitress in a gambling club in Mayfair. The actress who plays Teresa on TV uses a racial epithet to refer to Chang, and my custom in this episode is to use the words from the printed page, but not the much worse words delivered on television, so I will not repeat it, 
And anyway, Terence removes that awful word from the book entirely. On pages 75 and 76, late in the Part 3 material, Terence adds dialogue to a mute TV scene, the scene where a laundry delivery is made to Professor Lightfoot's house. This is a rare case for Terence where less would have been more. The pigtailed Chinese delivery driver, quote, chattered incomprehensibly at the inquiring police constable who's watching over the Lightfoot home. The home had been attacked the night before in story time, and for us, that was the part two cliffhanger. The constable answers the delivery worker in truly dreadful, simplified English. Quote, I get you, Johnny. Clean laundry come, dirty washing go away. End quote. Now, I never did get the chance to speak to my immigrant grandparents about how they were treated during their first days in America, but I'm quite positive they would have told me it would have been just about this badly. Early in the Part 4 material, top of Chapter 10, the cliffhanger resolution, Leela on TV is scripted as making a crude reference to Chang by Western perceptions as to his skin color. Terence removes that, and instead adds a funny line about how her Victorian clothes prevented the giant rat from biting into her leg. Even better is what Terence does with poor Mrs. Samuelson, or as I inaccurately referred to her a couple of times during my conversation with John and Kate, Mrs. Samuel. In Holmes' script, every Chinese character is a villain. In Holmes' script, there's one Irish character, and he's a drunkard. In Holmes' script, there's only one character with a Jewish name in the East End, which was a Jewish neighborhood at the time. That's the oft-mentioned but never seen theater wardrobe lady, Mrs. Samuelson, and she is called a bloodsucker on TV. I played that clip earlier in the program. Yeah. Terence completely deletes every scene that refers to Mrs. Samuelson. Perfect. Terence also gives Casey, the drunken Irish stagehand, a better death scene here, trying to run away from Greel, and his death is far more poignant, page 88, as its skinny hands reached out. Casey heard faint sounds of music from the stage above. Then everything was drowned out by the frightened pounding of his heart. That's far more literary than you would usually expect from late 70s Terence, but honestly, this whole book is full of passages like that. All right, I need to get out for a minute. While I'm away, here is a musical interlude. There's no obligation. I'm a crazy when shall we go and look for the cave creature? Perhaps it'll come looking for us. Terence removes both the singer and the song Daisy Bell from the book, sadly. As John and Kate mentioned earlier, a lot of trimming needed to be done at this point in the novelization, and not just the objectionable stuff. Terence, however, does give a good in-universe explanation for Lee San Chang's code switching. Page 89. During his act, he often spoke in the pidgin English that Englishmen expected from the Chinese. To be fair, John Bennett did that on television, too. On page 92, Terence retains the, quote, one of us is yellow, close quote line, having removed the word from Leela's dialogue earlier, because in this limited context, the line and that word makes sense as part of Chang's act, and considering the doctors just run away from him. And the, quote, foreign devil woman line that amused John earlier is an invention for the novelization, does not appear on TV. The doctor compliments Leela in the book for her analogy about the hole in the water bag while looking at her in, quote, mild surprise, close quote, there is no compliment on TV, 
And there's so much more, including long descriptions of the Part 4 Palace Theater Act from Chang's point of view. Part 5 in the book begins on page 100, as the Doctor and Leela help Professor Lifett recover from his home invasion and assault the night before. Terence leaves in the unfortunate phrase, Tong Wallas from TV, but cuts out several other suspect imprecations. Otherwise, the Part 5 material, Chapter 12, as John and Kate walked us through earlier, is particularly trimmed, if not scarred, missing some great TV lines of dialogue. And that's the real heartbreak of Talons. Why some of us who acknowledge the deep, deep problems in the story still can't give it up. Now, it's not like Talons is Doctor Who's only suspect classic series story. Marco Polo, Abominable Snowmen, both have major problems with representation of Eastern culture. Tomb of the Cybermen, Terror of the Autons, and even my beloved Creature from the Pit all have issues. Talons is not the one sacrificial lamb. It is not like if you get rid of this one story, you purge the entire franchise of its sins. Well, you will purge it of Mr. Sin, but that's a different story. Talons is an offender, but it's not the only one. It's far from the only one. And these sins are not even limited to the classic series. Take the first ten TV seasons, and that spans 13 calendar years of the new series. There is a ton, a metric ton, of fat jokes or other digs at female appearance. But making this point the long way around, reading these scenes in Chapter 12, The Doctor, Leela, and Lightfoot, and then Lightfoot and Jago, and of course, I don't need to tell you that Big Finish have done two decades worth of Jago and Lightfoot stories, Read the online transcript of the TV episodes to compare the material from the book. The good scenes in this story are wonderful. Talons has a long, long shelf life. Much of Torchwood's backstory, as I mentioned to John and Kate earlier, ties into Talons' future history. And of course, Big Finish, like I said, have spent the better part of two decades living in this world. Talons is, in a sense, one of Doctor Who's foundational texts. The trick is to balance respect for the story with disrespect for its worldview. When Chang is dying, the doctor on TV says, It was a good act, Chang. That's a nice eulogy to a dying baddie. But Terence extends the moment. One of the best I've ever seen, said the doctor gently in the book. Tom Baker didn't do much gently on TV, but Terence is able to do that. Now, as I also mentioned to John and Kate earlier, there is a drastic shift between the way the Doctor treats Chang in Part 5 versus the way he treats Greel in Part 6. Chang is, in many respects, a caricature. He is an expression of what you would now call white supremacy. However, John Bennett plays him as a fully formed character with emotions, and like I said, his death scene is kind of touching. Compare that to the way the Doctor treats Greel in the Part 6 material. Here's a clip from television. Oh, Doctor, you are an unusual man. But in opposing me, you have gone far out of your depth. You have taken something from me. I want it back. Now, I wonder what that could be. I'm always borrowing things from people and then forgetting where I put them. Hmm. It's a terrible habit. I have never appreciated frivolity. It was in that bag. It is not there now. Give it to me. Not one of these? <sighs> the time key, Doctor. Oh, the time key. I'm time. Now, heavens to Betsy. When will I last see that? I'll give you three seconds, Doctor, and then Mr. Sin will kill the girl. One, two, three, kill her! <laughs> Stop! Is this what you want? The trionic lattice? Huh? Give it to me! Careful, careful. I might have dropped it. I'll kill you! Crystalline. Probably break into a thousand pieces. You arrogant jackanapes! When I'm crowded, I get nervous. Call your dogs off. Back, back! That's better. Give me that key, and I will spare her life! Never trust a man with dirty fingernails. Well, you can trust me to kill her if you do not immediately put it down. Now obey me at once. 
I mean, with exchanges like that, how do you not have a soft spot for this story? If nothing else, that exchange launched my unfortunate lifelong habit of using heavens to Betsy as an exclamation. Of course, in the next scene, Terence for the book retains the unfortunate Jago line, more wongs for the tong, which I don't care what year this story is supposed to take place. That line is never not going to be cringeworthy. No! Spare me! Please! Born of evil, now I destroy you! The second time! The second attempt on my life by this sea devil! I'm gonna steal! No! No, I have a better fate for you! She will be the first mortal to feed my regeneration! Kill me any way you wish! Unlike you, I'm not afraid to die! We shall see! Bring the tigress here! But my camps, the extraction process was considered the most painful of all. They pleaded for anything but this. I shall not plead. But I promise you this. When we are both in the great hereafter, I shall hunt you down, bent face, and put you through my agony a thousand Silence times! Silence the spitfire! That clip really has nothing to do with the themes of this episode. But Talon's is the first novelization with Leela in it. And boy, oh boy, how awesome is Louise Jameson? Leela should be a thankless role, an Amazon warrior, hired more for her legs than anything else, but Jameson thinks through every line of dialogue and makes Leela so, so, so much more than just a pinup girl. There hasn't been much time to talk about Terence's other changes to the text. For this episode, I've been focusing on the book's portrayal of race and inclusion. John and Kate did make reference to a few other changes from the TV story to the novelization. For my part, it's important, I think, to point out that Terence changes the manner of Greel's death in Chapter 15. That's the Part 6 material, the climax. On TV, Greel stumbles into his extraction cabinet, from which he had previously killed ten young women, one during the story, and he becomes the final victim of the process. In the book, Terence does not have Greel ironically hoist on his own petard, but rather has him electrocuted in the time cabinet instead. The last line of the book is also one of Terence's best ever closing lines. Quote, Chang's face stared out from the poster as their footsteps faded away into the fog. Talon's, although it has some faults, mostly inherited from the TV serial, is still a terrific adaptation of a script that, if you ignore all those faults, and again, it's far from the only Doctor Who story to have those particular faults, the terrific mix of sci-fi concepts and wordplay. The end result is, apart from several very badly dated expressions, a pretty glorious book. Terrence could famously make even bad TV scripts look good in print, but here he's handed what's long been considered, over all objections, to be one of the all-time best, and he makes it even better. To quote the doctor's final compliment to a dying Chang in the book, and to aim it at Terence instead, one of the best I've ever seen. Next time, on Doctor Who Literature, we close out the slate of 1977 Target books by covering one of the rare non terence books of the season. We're on season 14 for the third straight novelization, and this time we circle back from that season's last story, to its first, and we will have joining us for the second time someone intimately familiar with the writing, scripting, and adapting of the story in question. Join us as we travel to 15th century Italy as the Doctor and Sarah Jane Smith attend Doctor Who and the Mask of Madragora. Thank you for joining me on another episode of the Doctor Who Literature Podcast. I'm Jason, your host and editor and producer. Special thanks to my special guests, Kate Orman and John Blum. This podcast can be found on most of your podcast apps of choice. You can find all past episodes at anchor.fm slash Doctor Who Lit. It really helps if you rate five stars and subscribe. You can find me on Twitter at Doctor Who Novels, that's D-R Who Novels, on Twitter using the hashtag Doctor Who Pilgrimage, that's D-R Who Pilgrimage, and on email at Doctor Who Literature, that's D-R Who Literature, at gmail.com. 
please drop me a line with your comments, questions, and suggestions. Thank you for listening, and whatever you do, keep turning the pages. Thank <laughs> you.